Hi everyone, welcome to another tutorial about Node Canvas. This time I'm going to talk about behavior trees and I try to give you an idea what behavior trees are and how they work and how you can use them in your own game logic. Right here I have a behavior tree already set up. That's pretty simple. It has a sequencer and a couple nodes that move the head towards individual buckets. If we run this, you can see that the head is going in a circle. And in the graph, you see that each node gets executed. And when the head arrives at each bucket, it starts moving to the next bucket. This is the core logic of a sequencer. It executes its nodes from left to right until the first node returns failure. Since none of these nodes return failure, the execution is a simple sequence of going from left to right and then repeating. Now, if we were to change that to a selector, we can do that by right-clicking the node and using the replace function and selecting the selector node. Suddenly, the head only goes to the first bucket. That's because the first node returns success and the selector stops executing as soon as one of its child nodes returns success. In essence, the selector is basically the inverse of a sequencer. We can actually restore the functionality by decorating each node with a invert decorator. We can do this by right-clicking a node and going to decorate decorators inward and you can see immediately it starts bouncing between the first two nodes back and forth. And if we keep adding the inward to other nodes, you can see we can restore the sequence as it were before. So now we have the same logic as before, just with a selector. Coming back to the original sequence, what if you wanted the head only to move when there's another object close by? You can do that by dragging out a connection down here and selecting the condition node. In the condition node, we are going to assign a condition that checks for a target, target within distance. And as an object, we'll just pick this blue one right here and change distance to five. Now, when we run this, the head won't move because the other object isn't in range yet. When we move the head in range, it starts moving and goes about its job. Now, if you move the head away, it will stop. And when we get closer, it starts again. Now, what if you wanted the head to stop right away when the other object is no longer in range? You can do that by selecting the sequencer and setting it to dynamic. This causes the sequencer to re-evaluate all of the nodes. So now the blue head is out of range, the yellow head stopped immediately. And if you get closer, you'll see that it continues to move slightly towards the other target because as we get closer, the condition becomes true for just a split second. And if we get very close, it will go about its way and keep on going in a circle. And if we move away, it will stop. Now, if we get closer again, it will continue to the first node because it's re-evaluating all of the nodes. So it will restart the sequence. Here I've set up a more complex graph, this time with a red hat, and we also have a blue hat. I'll just run this right now, select the evil hat. And if I get closer, you see that the graph starts changing. In this case, we are using a sequence at the start, so we're going from left to right, and then we have a selector which also executes from left to right. And as you learned, the only difference is how it reacts to returning true or false from its child nodes. The blue head is now closer to the red head, and thus the condition node here becomes false. This causes the selector to go on to executing the next node in the sequence. In that case, we are checking if the enemy is in view angle. Since the enemy is not in the view angle of the red hat, the red hat is facing us and it can't see to the right, the condition returns false. With the invert decorator, we are inverting this return value to a success. And this goes back to the selector. The selector also returns success back up to the sequencer. The sequencer then starts executing the second node and the third node in its sequence. And it adds a force to the red hat, which makes it bounce up. And that also returns success. And then we are waiting for 1.5 seconds. And the third node has these moving lines because it takes a while for the wait to complete. Thus the head keeps jumping up and down. Now if I move the head closer in the view angle of the red hat, you see it turns and then runs away and then it starts being happy again. To debug this, we can add a breakpoint 
to this sequencer node here. Let's right click and set a breakpoint. Now if I move the enemy head closer and in view angle, you'll see that the execution will stop. And now we can inspect the graph. The selector has become a success value from the distance check. It has become a success value from the enemy in view angle check due to the invert decorator. And then it starts executing its third node, which is the sequencer here, which makes the head rotate and then move away in a sequence. When we continue running this, the head turns around and moves away. If we would like a more realistic logic here, we can reconnect this to a parallel node. That's this one right here. It's essentially the same as a sequencer, except that it runs all of its child nodes at once. And in this case, it will rotate the head while it's also moving away. Let's try this. Let's take the evil head again and move it close to the red head. And now you can see it turned and moved away at the same time. Maybe you like both behaviors in your game and you want to switch between them randomly. So let's add a probability selector here, right here. Right click on the empty space to open the pop-up and choose the composite probability selector. Now we can reconnect the selector to the probability selector and the probability selector will connect to both types of logic here. You can see that in the connections you have a 50% chance for both to happen. You can change this in the properties so you can make one type of behavior more likely than the other. You can even add a chance of it failing directly so it doesn't do anything at all, but we don't want that right here. Now let's try this with the probability selector in place. The redhead will turn and then move away with twice as much probability than turning and moving away at the same time. It'll turn around and move away. And if we go closer again, this time it turned and moved. Let's say this turn and move behavior is a reusable pattern that you want to use in multiple graphs. You can do that by designing these subtrees in an asset graph or in an asset behavior tree. I've already created one right here. It's called the flea behavior. And if you look at this, it's the parallel node with the rotate and the move actions. Since this behavior tree is an asset graph, it doesn't know which game object is the self game object. And thus it shows this as a warning or error, but you can discard this because when you add this as a subgraph in an actual scene graph, the reference will be injected correctly. So when we go back to the previous behavior tree and right click on the empty space and select subtree, we can either create a new graph with the button here or we can go over to the inspector and select an existing asset graph. Let's select the flea behavior here and we'll just reconnect this. I'll select the probability selector and hit delete on the keyboard and reconnect this to the sub behavior. When we run this, you can see it will work just as before. Yep, it turns and runs away. So that makes your original graph a lot less complex because you can take those and move them away or delete them and you have much less complexity in your original graph plus you gain the benefit of being able to reuse this behavior in other graphs. By the way, in case you're wondering these kinds of groups, you can create them by left clicking and dragging and holding control before releasing the rectangle and thus you can create a group which contains one or more nodes in it. You can also set it to auto scale and you can right click here and select rename to give this a name and we'll just call this fleeing. That way you can design behavior trees in a modular way. Just for exercise, let's try moving the whole flea behavior with the enemy close conditions into its own behavior tree asset. To do that, simply select the topmost node which you wish to convert to a asset graph. In this case, it's the selector. Right click the selector and choose convert to subtree. Then select the folder in which you wish to save the asset and give it a proper name like check distance and angle then flee and save it. This part of the tree has now been converted into an asset. It's located in the project view as an asset file and in the original graph it's automatically linked to a sub behavior tree and the only thing we need to do is delete the group that we no longer need. 
Now let's run this again, move the blue head in range again, and you can see it's running away. The red head is still running away, and the behavior tree is now much more concise. This concludes the basics of behavior trees. I strongly encourage you to just play around with the trees and what they can do in a simple sample scene, get a feeling for how they work, how they behave, and then start thinking about how you can use them in your own logic. Don't forget that by right-clicking, you can at any time change a node's type by using the replace function. And you can also decorate it with a decorator that changes the return value or adds a weight function or checks a condition before running the node and things like that. I hope this gave you a good impression of what behavior trees can do and how they work. In case you have any questions, go to the Node Canvas forum or the Discord channel. And if you like this video, please subscribe to my channel and come back for the next video. Until then, create something awesome with behavior trees and Node Canvas. See you and goodbye.